Scotland, and I'm sure that you will encourage them, as indeed your own Scottish Government has already done, to contribute to our consultation on the independence referendum. I point out to the Minister that I don't have my own Scottish Government. <laughs> uh, Mr Philip Hollibone. Uh, a long-term solution which we're working on with the Department of Work and Pensions. No specific, um, Mr Speaker, are you coughing at me? <laughs> I think I'll quit while I'm ahead. I've never coughed at the Honourable Lady, and I wasn't intending to start now, but I'm grateful for her compassionate concern for the state of my health. If she wanted to finish the answer, she could, but she doesn't, so she won't. Business question, Angela Eagle. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I hope you don't cough at me either. Um, will, will the Leader of the House please give us the business for the week? Yesterday, we heard the Prime Minister do that to the 79-year-old Honourable Member for Bolsover. That problem was repeated today. Uh, order. 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 Mr Shelbrook, who is now engaging busily in a conversation with the Honourable Gentleman for Harrogate and Ersborough. Calm yourself. The Honourable Lady is raising a point of order about manners to which I intend to listen and with which I will deal. And it hardly helps if people are sniggering and smirking at the point the Honourable Lady is making. Point of order, Fiona McTaggart. A Minister nods. Civil Aviation Bill. Second reading, what day? Tomorrow. Said with great confidence by the whip on duty, tomorrow. We come now to the main business. Thank you. Uh, point of order and main. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I, I seek your guidance. Is it appropriate parliamentary language for a member of Parliament to cover, call other honourable members Neanderthals, particularly when they haven't even been anywhere near the debate or participated in or engaged in it? Yeah. Do you think it's a somewhat judgmental statement, Mr Speaker? Well, I think if we're going to have a prohibition on judgmentalism, uh, we're setting ourselves rather an exacting test. What I would say to the honourable lady is twofold. First of all, I'm not aware, though it's not relevant to the appropriateness of her point of order, who the target, I can try to speculate about it, of this intended abuse was. But secondly, if the target of the intended abuse is at least one member that I can think of, I rather imagine that far from complaining about it, he will take it as the greatest possible compliment that has ever been paid to him. Uh, point of order. I, I choose randomly for a point of order. Mr Jacob Rees-Mogg. Point of order. M Mr Speaker, I think many honourable members would consider being called ne ne Neanderthals remarkably modern. <laughs> <laughs> I note the honourable gentleman's value judgment and indeed his sense of humour. If there are no further points of order... And in high streets throughout this country. Mr Marcus Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Ex excessive... Order. Order. However angry and irate the Honourable Gentleman is, I gather he's shouting out about the fact that he hasn't had an answer to his question. If that were to legitimise that sort of ranting, there would be permanent ranting in the House of Commons under successive governments over the last hundred years. We can't tolerate it. Mr Marcus Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Again, I rather suspect, I'm not a lawyer, I say that as a matter of some very considerable pride, but as far as I'm aware... No, you shouldn't. Oh, order, order. I apologise for interrupting the Leader of the Opposition. I exhorted some calm on the opposition benches. I now do so on the government benches, and I say to the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Shrewsbury and Atcham, in the nicest and kindest and most public-spirited possible way, if he does insist on gesticulating, which he shouldn't, it's pretty silly to do it when he's standing right next to me. <laughs> the Leader of the Opposition... <laughs> shall imply only in so far the house must now calm itself all that gesticulation and hand waving from the shadow chancellor anybody would have thought that I thought the right honourable gentleman was playing with these cooking utensils <laughs> but I want to hear 
Well, he's pointing somewhere. But I do genuinely, and I think the House and the country will want to hear the Prime Minister, as I hope they also wanted to hear the Leader of the Opposition. Let's hear the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I think we... I think we know why the benches opposite are so depleted. They've been eating his lasagna and they're, uh, they're all recovering. There is no simple link between no crime and the... Oh, the immigration minister is getting very excited. As he... As... That the deal for an opposition front bencher of the honourable gentleman's important but middling rank is one question... <laughs> One question a month, not one question and multiple heckles. I know he's trying to reinvent the deal, but the deal is, as I've just described, the Home Secretary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank the Minister for that reply, but news content aside, should there not be more flexibility in licences and franchises to allow commercial radio to respond to market conditions? I find it slightly difficult to hear the... uh question now, Mr. Speaker, but I think, uh, I think uh, the, um, the difficulty in hearing was not attributable to the questioner, but to ministerial nose-blowing, which is entirely understood. <laughs> Mr. Bill Esterson. So, so let, me ex- let me explain to him. It's about the fragmentation of commissioning. Right, you've got it. Okay, good. I'm glad you've got it. And maybe when you get up, you can answer the question. Now... I say to the Leader of the Opposition, keep me out of it. I said it to the Prime Minister, I said it here, Mr. Red Miliband. Now, the reason he's lost the. Co- <laughs> now, the, now, the reason he's lost the. Co- order, or order, order, mem- order, mem- order. I say that to the Shadow Chancellor as well. Members might be enjoying order. Members might be enjoying themselves. I ask them to think of what the country thinks. Order of what the country thinks of how we conduct ourselves. Mr Ed Miller. He's lost the confidence. That's what I care about. It ought to be what he cares about. Yeah. Order. O- order. Can I just say to the Honourable Gentleman, chuntering inanely and to no obvious benefit or purpose from a sedentary position, that the Chair is perfectly capable of adjudicating upon what is and is not in order, and it does not behove an Honourable Member to seek to intervene in such matters. These proceedings have thus far been entirely orderly. That is the beginning and the end of the matter. Mr Peter Bone. Let me just say this for the benefit of the Honourable Lady and of the House. Whether or not the Honourable Lady is sponsored by Unite, and I emphasise whether or not she is. I'm happy to accept she's not if that is the factual position. I don't know. Whether or not she is. I don't need any help from a junior government whip. He wouldn't know where to start. And there is absolutely... (laughs) He says he's a senior government whip, is it? I understand my honourable friend's concern. I also know that he raised this on a point of order, uh, Mr Speaker, on Monday, and uh, I have in front of me your response, which I won't read out because it would take longer than you like me to take out the dispatch box. But I would... (laughs) But but I I, I would just reiterate very briefly uh, your advice, Mr Speaker... It is, it is quite a long statement. Um, in a low-carbon economy, the honourable gentleman shouting from a sedentary position, a man of the seniority of the honourable member for Seven Oaks, figure of very considerable celebrity in the House, doesn't have to shout from a sedentary position. We can all see and admire him from a distance. In the whole 13 years of your government, you didn't actually put up tax from, from 40 to, to 50, so... I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman, but I'm not sure why he's referring to my government. There's no reference to my government in these matters at all. I'm sure that's what the Honourable Gentleman meant, and it would be good in future if that's what he'd say. The at- attempt being made at the weekend in order to mark uh, the Palestinian Land Day from the overall concerns of both sides. I would actually like to get some progress down the order paper, so we need shorter answers. The word is shorter. I've explained it. Shorter answers. Shorter answers is what is required. The Minister's really got to practice it. Mr David Ward. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Mr Speaker. 
This is, this is a pro- Order! Order the usual level of orchestration from the usual suspects on the government backbenches. Be quiet, Mr. Burns. It will be Don't better for your health. You're the Minister Don't for Health. Back. Get better, Mr. Ed Miliband. <laughs> if there are no further points of order, we now move on to the next thing, as the <laughs> senior whip helpfully points out, namely motion number four on children and young persons, which is indeed the next thing, as he eloquently puts it. Legal Aid, Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Bill, Consideration of Lord's Message. Now! <laughs> well, I, I don't know what the Honourable Gentleman had for breakfast or for lunch, but it has clearly served to fortify him, and we're, we're grateful to the whip on duty. Mr Robert Flello. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The, the Secretary of State has had three opportunities. The, 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 the trouble with the Honourable Gentleman is he's as excitable as he is good-natured. He's a very amiable fellow, but we don't need the Honourable Gentleman's advice on decorum. He should calm himself and take whatever tablets are required for the purpose. Mr Robert Flello. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Consideration completed. Third reading what day? Tomorrow. Thank you. I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. <laughs> Point of order, just in case I hadn't heard, the, the Honourable Gentleman was kindly in his consideration. Uh, many important businesses in her constituency can do their job efficiently. Richard Fuller. The Honourable Gentleman was previously interested, but not, not if he doesn't want to. It's not obligatory, but if he wishes to, he can. No, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, but the question I was going to ask has already been asked. The Honourable Gentleman is in danger of setting a real precedent, but because it's already been said, it doesn't need to be said again. That really is setting a new precedent in parliamentary practice. Mr Stuart Jackson. Mr Speaker, we came... Order. I do appeal to the House to calm down. The Honourable Gentleman member for North Durham, assisted by his colleagues, is chuntering repetitively from a sedentary position in breach of the conventions of the House. And I ask the Honourable Gentleman to exercise what modicum of self-restraint he's able in the circumstances to muster. Secretary of State. Many members have raised the question of the legislation. And let me just, I think if the Honourable Gentleman from a sedentary position stops mumbling and trying to put me off, he will hear the answer. He will, hear the, he will hear the answer to the question that his colleagues have been asking in respect of the legislation, which is... Can I just say, for a moment, I wish that it were just mumbling. It is very much more vocal than mumbling. It is too noisy. It is excessive. And it should desist. Let us hear the Secretary of State. As many as I've got a say, aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We come now to... <laughs> The adjournment. I'm not sure whether it's mumbling or some other noise that's taking place, but it seems relatively good natured. We come now to the adjournment. And with innovative ways of using our hard won credibility, which we wouldn't have if we listened to the muttering idiot sitting opposite me. Minister, who's so overexcited he might suffer a relapse, and I'm a compassionate chap. I don't want that to happen. But the Prime Minister will please withdraw the word idiot. It's unparliamentary. A simple withdrawal will suffice. We're grateful. So then they come to the maximal. I don't think maximal is a word, Mr. Speaker. Your vocabulary is better than mine, and perhaps I should ask you to rule on it later in the day. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, I know you're about to tell me that I'm. Oh, you're not. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think that's very good. It's just that you were frowning, Mr. Speaker, and I've known you long enough to know that a frown um, may indicate that you were about to, to, to stop my flow. So let me go back, let me go back um, to the original uh, reason behind this debate. Uh, I was tempted along the um, uh, other path by, my honorable, by the Honourable Gentleman. Um, Order. 
<laughs> I'm sorry if the right honourable gentleman was concerned that I was frowning. Perhaps I can satisfy simultaneously his curiosity and that of the honourable gentleman member for North East Somerset. I've made inquiries, as the honourable member for North East Somerset would expect. I'm now in a position to tell the honourable gentleman in the House that the word in question, maximal, is the penultimate word in the second column of page 1720 of the new shorter Oxford English Dictionary. Yeah. I know the Honourable Gentleman already knew that, and I'm just reminding him. <laughs> Mr Keith Baz. Mr Speaker, I'm enormously grateful that my speech should, will go down in history uh, as the one in which you made such an important ruling, and thank you very much for, <laughs> for choosing my speech to do this. Nigel Adams! Nigel Adams! I'm really very worried about the conduct of the Education Secretary in the average classroom. He would have been excluded by now. He must calm himself. Mr Nigel Adams. Um, I, think, I, I think the exchange... The... Order. On both sides, members need to calm down. I always listen with great interest to the pronouncements of the Secretary of State for Education. But I say to him, with all courtesy, that his pronouncements from a sedentary position on matters for which he has no direct ministerial responsibility, add nothing. I'm not interested. I don't want to hear them. The right honourable gentleman should sit silently and listen to the debate. If he feels unable to do that, he's welcome to depart the chamber and we'll just about manage without him. Harriet Harman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. When it was the... Look, um, Mr Speaker, I'm trying to set out... Or, order. It is up to the Honourable Gentleman to show some sensitivity to the conventions of the House. He's asked. The answer was no. He shouldn't keep persisting at it. He can have another later if he wants. But order. Order. I don't need any guidance from the Honourable Member for Broxtow upon the strength of her two years in the House about correct <laughs> parliamentary... Procedure. The Honourable Lady is a very distinguished figure and a rising star, but I think I can probably just about get by without her assistance in this important matter. Harriet Harman. And we certainly do. The Honourable Gentleman is signalling from a sedentary position his interest in participating. He's holding out his hands to imply wings of an aeroplane. He may have flown here, but I'm afraid he didn't fly here quickly enough. <laughs> It's always a delight to hear the product of the Honourable Gentleman's lucubrations, but I'm afraid that we'll have to wait for another day, as he wasn't here at the start. We'll hear the Honourable Gentleman another time. We'll save him up. It will be worth hearing, I feel sure. Mr Mark Minns is... More than half. More than half. More than... Order! 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 Sir Tony! You are now officially a statesman, and a statesman shouldn't yell across the chamber. Sir Tony, calm yourself. No, no point of order required at this stage. I shall hear the Honourable Gentleman on another occasion, with great anticipation. Mr Kevin Brennan. Speaker, I was just testing their numeracy. It is, of course, 30%. <laughs> it's red balls. Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, the... Uh, the systematic lying. Uh, everything else will be slowed up, the more noise there is. So I don't care what the exhortation is to people to create a wall of noise. That should and must not happen in this chamber. And if we end up being much slower because people are mindlessly bawling their heads off from either side of the house, we will be slower. And I don't think the public will be much impressed by that sort of behaviour from either side of the house. Mr Ed Balls. A similar level to that which prevailed under the previous government. And it is not, of course, the only prosecutor for fraud. I'm sure we're much better informed, but anybody would think that these lawyers are paid by the word. <laughs> Mr Philip Davis. Mr Speaker... This time, we have put in place... Order. We now face the unenviable situation of having an exchange across the chamber. Mr Heaton-Harris, calm yourself. If you wish to give vent to your views and you behave like the good man you can at your best be, you might succeed in catching the eye of the chair. And if you're not able to do so, you might find it more difficult. Minister. Order. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. As many as I've got to say, aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. no. 
I think they are harmful to us in terms of the health of members in this place. Can I appeal to members to show some courtesy towards members who are speaking, not to witter away as though their own conversations are somehow more important. Sit quietly, or if you're not interested in doing so, get out. We can manage without you. Caroline Lucas. That includes day 400M, that includes this too, and it includes the typhoon. The question was simply far too long. I called the Honourable Gentleman. I don't know why the Honourable Gentleman's smirking about it. He's abused his order. He's abused his privilege, and he ought to learn from it. Minister of State. The Honourable Lady has provided an object lesson to new members on how to shoehorn one's own question into someone else's, and we are greatly obliged to her. Mr Ian Swales. I'm afraid that that was an examination that was designed by the Labour Party, introduced by the Labour Party, and the people... And the people... Oh, order. Order. I'm bound to say to the Honourable Gentleman Member for Cardiff West that he makes more noise chuntering from a sedentary position than he does in strumming on his guitar, and I'm bound to say that the noise is not as melodious. The Secretary of State. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have nothing to add to your excellent uh, uh, judgment from the chair. Yeah, yeah. Mr. David Davis. Uh, I. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, order. Uh, we'll hear from Top Cat in a moment. Uh, not just yet. Uh, I should have explained. Mr. David Davis, he with the slightly greyer hair and the longer service in the House. <laughs> Which is infinitely preferable to many other countries to whom we have extradition arrangements. Great interest for the Honourable Gentleman, but I must say to him that if in practising in the UK courts he was paid by the word, he would now be an immensely wealthy man, the Home Secretary. The question is that new clause 9 be read a second time. As many as I have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. Oh dear. Of the contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Thank you. The question is that new clause 10 and new schedule 1 be added to the bill. As many as I have that opinion say aye. Aye! Of the contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Yes. I'm sorry to disappoint colleagues, but we must now move on. Points. The Honourable Gentleman has been in the House since 1987. He knows perfectly well that points of order come after statements and not before them. I think he was just teasing me and teasing the House. I feel certain. Well done. There's noise on both sides. Mr Kaczynski, I have had reason to indicate this to you before. But you must calm down. I think you need to go on an anger management course, man. But you must get order. Get a grip! Mary Cray. Yesterday was in fact a sad day for me because I was in mourning because Queen's Park Rangers sadly lost against Arsenal in the tenth minute following, following a goal which I can only conclude was offside. So yesterday was a day of mourning. The Arsenal result was extremely satisfactory and I was there to observe it. And Mr Justin Tomlinson. We come now to the main business. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Public Service Pensions Bill, second reading. The whip says now. Now. I'm grateful to the whip. I call... I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for his point of order, and in response I make two points. First, I think that... We're always obliged to the Honourable Gentleman, the member for Rhonda, for chuntering from a sedentary position about hearses. Uh, if he'll be good enough to allow me to intervene on him and to respond to the point of order from the Honourable Gentleman. Order, 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 order. Government backbenchers, including ministers, apparently approaching maturity. They've really got to... No, I fear not. They've got to tackle their behavioural problems before it's too late. Ed Miliband. This is an incredibly serious issue, Chancellor. This, this is about taxpayers' money. This is about taxpayers' money and incredibly large sums of taxpayers' Order. money. Order. Mr Zahawi, I'm sure that in your own way you mean well. <laughs> but you are far too excitable. It's no good looking up and around and at places outside the chamber and waving your hands in a bizarre manner. What you need to do is to calm down. It will be good for you, good for the House, good for Stratford-upon-Avon. Mr Chris Leslie. It's to the right. Oh, dare. Isn't that a better way of building affordable homes and boosting the economy? Very experienced member, the question is about using the revenue to the order from the auction. That's the term of order. 
Order. No assistance is required from the Honourable Gentleman. He'll accept my ruling and he can like it or lump it. Minister. European Union, Croatian Accession and Irish Protocol Bill, second reading. Now, <laughs> I'm grateful to the whip for his very audible now. I call the Minister. The Let me explain. The Shadow Chancellor, the Shadow Chancellor is not here. Order. The Right Honourable Gentleman is in danger of being heckled rather noisily and stupidly by both sides. The, <laughs> the, the, the Right Honourable Gentleman's, the Right Honourable Gen, the Right Honourable Gentleman's answer will be heard, however long it takes. So the juvenile delinquency should stop now. The Deputy Prime Minister. Well, this debate is flushing out the government position, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, isn't it? The Minister keeps heckling from the front bench, but clearly we now know, we know... Order. I just ask the Right Honourable Gentleman to resume his seat. Let me, order. Let me say once and for all to the Honourable Lady who has been conducting a running commentary since she sat on that bench at the start of the debate. Stop it. I don't wish to hear it. Neither does the House. The Right Honourable Gentleman, the Secretary of State, will respond in due course. If the Honourable Lady is dissatisfied with what has been said, her Right Honourable Friend will have the chance to respond. I don't want to hear the sedentary chuntering and the finger wagging and all the rest of it. The Honourable Lady, she can say poo if she wants, the Honourable Lady will accept the ruling of the Chair and either behave or get out of the Chamber. I don't yeah, mind which yeah. it is. Andy Burnham. Yeah, uh, thank yeah. you, uh, Mr Speaker. You know, I, I very much hope when the um, Government... Order. Order. Look, let me just say to the Minister once and for all, no, I say to the Minister, perhaps she'd have the courtesy to listen when she's being spoken to from the Chair. It is not acceptable for any member of this House to treat this as a private conversation between him or herself and the member on his or her feet. If the Minister is dissatisfied with what is being said, other people on her benches can pick up those points. It is totally unacceptable to behave in this way, and it will stop straight away. And I hope the whip has noticed it, and I'll be speaking to others about the matter. Kerry McCarthy. For example, uh, in North Wales, an independent was elected last Thursday, who subsequently turned out to be a member of the Liberal Democrats. Oh! Does, he, does he feel that uh, that would constitute grounds yeah. for me? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I don't... I know he thinks otherwise, but being a member of the Liberal Democrats is not yet a crime. It's not yet a crime. It's not yet a crime. And, and by the way, and by the way, and by, order! Uh, this is question time. Members can't divide the House now. No opportunity. The Deputy Prime Minister. Labour illiberalism pushed to new, new extremes. Mr. Speaker, the order. 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 The Honourable Gentleman shouldn't be chuntering from a sedentary position about who came in the chamber when. I know perfectly well what I'm doing. The Honourable Gentleman has been here for some time. He's been legitimately called, and that's all there is to it. Very straightforward. The Honourable Gentleman should keep stum. He might learn something. <laughs> the Secretary of State. Do you hear that? Uh. Order. The Honourable Member for Reading East has wandered almost like a nomad albeit all at one end of the chamber, across three benches, but I hope he's now comfortably perched and ready to give the House the benefit of his thoughts. Mr Rob Wilson. I, I thank you for that kind introduction, Mr Speaker. <laughs> different places across the country are clearly take, proceeding at a different, uh, different pace, uh, and Jones. I'm sure North Yorkshire, from my own experience of them, will be amongst those at the forefront of this competition. Mr Andrew Jones. Question. We're grateful to him. I shouldn't have forgotten quite so quickly. I do, I'm sorry to disappoint. I'm sure it was otherwise extremely memorable. It was entirely my fault. I'm sorry to disappoint the Liberal Democrat members, and I note their enthusiasm and eagerness, but unfortunately neither of the Honourable Gentlemen was in the chamber at the start of the session, so neither of them could speak. The Honourable Gentleman should... No, the Honourable Gentleman should resume his seat. Order. The Honourable Gentleman should resume his seat. He wasn't here. That's the end of the matter. The Honourable Gentleman should resume his seat. OK, we come now to the statement on energy. Ah! We're grateful to the Secretary of State in the nick of time. I'm sure he would have been very happy for the statement to be delivered by the Minister of State. But it will be delivered by the Secretary of State, Mr Ed Davey.
The eyes to the right, 334. The nose to the left, 5. So the nose, the eyes have it. <laughs> the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Don't get too excited, Mr. Wishart. <laughs> Unlock. The milking of pigs is a novelty. <laughs> and although I'm not an expert on these matters, I rather hazard the guess that it would prove to be an unprofitable activity. <laughs> Mr. Bill Esterson. <laughs> Number three. Speaker. <laughs> Fabricant. Well, Mr Speaker, the last three questioners, I agree with everything they've said. I think the Honourable Member for Banbury have given comprehensive answers, and I have nothing to add. <laughs> I hope the moment will be recorded. It's a first, certainly from the Honourable Gentleman, Mr Chris Bryant. Well, can I just make a point? 150... Oh, no. Order, order, order. I don't require any help from the honourable gentleman. He should concentrate on the pursuit of his own duties to the best of his ability. Uh, order, the honourable gentleman has perambulated around the chamber, but if he assures me that he has remained at all times within it, then we must hear him. It's a very curious approach, but it, it's not of itself a breach of the standing orders of the House. I've, He's been hiding. Let's hear from Mr Alex Shelbrook. I am, I am most grateful to you, Mr Speaker. Indeed, I have, I have moved around. I fear the enunciator is rather overexcited. I can assume only that it's not quite got accustomed, as I haven't either, to the spectacle of the Honourable Gentleman Member for Shipley using an iPad in the chamber. It's quite a remarkable state of affairs, upon which he is, of course, to be congratulated. Hugh Rankin davis <laughs> Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. Yes. Visits on official business are subject to the requirement of advanced disclosure to the member whose constituency is affected. The level of busyness of a member is not a material factor. Often these very busy, very senior, very respected ministers also have significant numbers of people available to help them. But we'll leave it there for today. Oh, the day wouldn't be complete without a point of order from the Honourable Gentleman, the member for Rhonda. Well, I haven't done for, for quite a while, Mr Speaker, but um, you may have noticed that on occasion, on occasion uh, ministers make speeches outside the House. Uh, and we have no notice of this and then, until suddenly we read about it in the Telegraph. And sometimes these are very important developments of new policy. But we now know for certain fact that the Prime Minister is going to be making a speech on Europe in the new year. And I think it's probably going to have some policy in it. So wouldn't it be a good idea if that speech were made in the House rather than anywhere else? I think that the new year will bring new challenges and it would be wise to embark on them then but not now. And in the hallowed words of the late Lord Whitelaw, I generally find that it is better to cross bridges only when I get to them. <laughs> <laughs> An announcement will be made imminently to confirm the name of the new Victims Commissioner and I look forward to working with her very closely indeed. A lot of work is being done to improve security and safety in courts in addition to what I will be doing and what the, and what the Victims Commissioner will be doing. Forward to hearing further details in due course if we've not already heard all of them. <laughs> Mr Rob Wilson. Minister. Mr. Speaker, my honourable friend made me uh, mention of the Victims Commissioner earlier. Uh, could, uh, could, I, could the House have an update on what progress is being made towards the appointment of a, of a Victims Commissioner and when, and when it is likely this appointment will be made? I look forward to announcing the name of the Victims Commissioner within the next few days. We are now all agog. <laughs> Mr. Steve McKay. <laughs> Very good, sir. <laughs> the, the minister's um, honourable, fr right honourable friend, a moment ago, seemed to confirm, in a reply to his honourable friend, that the legal aid bill for Abu Qatada came to half a million pound, as has been reported in the newspapers. Could he explain why then he refused to provide that figure in a written answer to me last week? 
Uh, well, I'll have to look into that. I'm not aware we refuse to provide anything since the figure has been made publicly available. Well, the plot thickens. Mr Robert Buckland. You, Mr Speaker. <laughs> we wouldn't want them to be dissuaded, that talent pool to be dissuaded from applying to work for small businesses. Yeah. I think on the strength of that answer, there's plenty of scope for an adjournment debate in which we'll hear no doubt about the Nordic nostrums and views about Neanderthals from the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Huddersfield, who was scarcely able to contain himself a moment ago. <laughs> Mr Nick Dakin. Thank you, Mr Speaker.